call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I think there are a couple of changes from the um, online version of the agenda. Um, one is, um, I don't think we're doing the item 12 TIF validation resolution. That's correct. Um, so that's not on it today. And uh, we uh, uh, maybe- I don't think we need to do the, gar the garage appeal. Uh, okay, yep. Session. So there's no executive session, um, no garage appeal item um, at the end. Oh, yeah, it's getting <laughs> shorter all the time. Okay, so uh, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna assume that the uh, uh, agenda is approved without objection. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for any member of the public to address the council on some item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and um, yeah, if you would um, say your name and where you're from and uh, try to keep your comments at two minutes or less, unless you would spoke to me ahead of time. Um, and uh, that's also generally true for any comments that you make um, on any other agenda item. So uh, any items to be brought up? Yes. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I have a num couple of items I'd like to raise to call to your attention. Um, First one I'll characterize as construction mismanagement. Uh, I have been photographing and inspecting and calling to some of your attention the issues with across on the Jacobs lot adjoining the Haney Trust lot. Uh, DEW piled a huge pile of road base the gray crushed particle stone and aggregate and sand mixed right against the river. I mean, literally a horizontal distance of maybe five feet. Uh, no silt fence. It continued to dry, roll down the bank into the river. Uh, I called it to Bill's attention. The, the pile was quickly moved and the fencing stacked on, the, on where the pile was. The bank was not cleaned up. When I later asked the DEW foreman about it, he said, oh no, that was just snow. He, he lied to my face. And I'm like, no, I have photos of the pile of road base. It is in the river. You can see it there. I've still got photos of it. It, it warrants an enforcement action. It warrants a fine. Um, the fact that there was no silt fence that in that location prior to the URB being stacked there is unconscionable. Uh, yesterday morning, I discovered uh, that they were putting fence across the driveway by drawing board. That single lane driveway that I had asked earlier that you would consider expanding to a second lane so that I, I and others don't have to back out, out into Main Street backwards when they meet oncoming traffic. They moved the fence eight, nine feet from the building so there's a narrow pedestrian walkway further narrowed by the existence of the merchant's dumpster. Uh, they said that they had the right to do that. I asked that Police station, police station, I see no street closure permits on, on my list. I called, left a message for Bill. Uh, Avishans was given no notice that that drive would be closed. Uh, Capital Coffee was not aware of it. And I do business at both of those places and it, it's, it's outrageous that even when the M&M was being knocked down, there was inadequate dust control. The brick wall came down, crashed, and sent a flood of dust right into people's face who were on forklifts at the time. There, there is severe mismanagement of this construction, and I don't know how to fix it, uh, but I remind you that I raised a caution about uh, a, something called a traffic study uh, during construction. <laughs> and the construction impacts, it's getting from bad to worse. Um, right now, the trucks delivering to those merchants are having to double park in Main Street and drive forklifts out through the alley, which has big potholes, and there's not sight line clearance. So you drive a forklift with forks sticking out and people are walking down the sidewalk with their earbuds in, we're an accident waiting to happen. Um, these are everyday occurrences, and it's just, it's, it needs inter serious intervention. Um, again, I wish I had the solution for you, but that's why y'all make the big bucks. Um, 
I'm going to change topics to Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Uh, the agenda for tomorrow's meeting was uh, notably uh, more detailed than ever before, uh, including the fact that there's only 30,000 remaining in the fund, and yet there's discussion of CVPSA bonding for a million dollar sole source radio system sim called Simulcast. That may or may not be a good thing, but there's never been a plan that justifies that does a cost benefit analysis. I know we are one of two members, or three if you count Capital Fire Mutual Aid, but there is a need for intervention by the city council to guide and steer and help evolve CVPSA to its next vision of itself. Um, I believe that the current track they're on is a dead end. I've said as much and provided a transcript um, that we need to be designing for a resilient failover architecture. We need to consider all of the opportunities of PSAP and dispatch, uh, uniform training statewide, et cetera. Uh, I won't go into more detail on that tonight, but just alert you that I would rather, if the money runs out and the thing crashes completely, it's going to be a long, hard slog to restart it again. Whereas re-steering it right now is an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. Uh, similarly, it's not at all a sure thing that the garage will ever be built on the riverfront. And the sooner we get a vision of a plan B into the discussion, the sooner you'll begin to heal the divide among Montpelier's business community, citizens, pro and against. Um, if we, again, wait for it to come to a complete lack of pulse, uh, it will be much harder to start that conversation. Uh, I was surprised that Bill was not aware of the other drawings that had been done for the pit that included a boutique hotel up alongside the pavilion. Uh, that architectural work had been done and it merits discussion. I do not think it's out of the question that Union Mutual, the state of Vermont, and the federal government would uh, work cooperatively together towards that as a possible solution. But the sooner we get plan B on the discussion of the business community, the sooner we will not have the, uh, I'll try not to use a, a national uh, analogy there. Um, The shelter closed. Uh, I told that to your attention two meetings ago. Um, we now have a lot of folks that are living down along the riverbank, uh, parking with their shopping carts and their. Uh, I'll note, and it was this was even discussed in the legislative committees, that we treat our homeless citizens, humans, with less dignity and respect than we treat our lost pets, and that that is unconscious. Uh, I suggested, had a conversation with Bill and a conversation with Lauren that we, the city council should step in and begin to do concerted oversight over the hundreds of thousands of dollars that comes to Central Vermont for those and begin to put an integrated plan together in a delicate way that doesn't step on uh, Good Samaritan's feelings, but that works with the available resources works with the health department on smoking cessation. Try to give these people a leg up uh, rather than uh, sweep them out like yesterday's trash. Um, I unusually got a, a $50 ticket for parking in an area that many others, including capstone insulation and others, have been parking on Baldwin Street. What, what a meter enforcement agent's doing on Baldwin Street at all when there's no meters? Uh, to me, smells of selective enforcement. I do not want to have to dig into other tickets issued along that street and uh, frequency of, but I believe it was clearly selective enforcement. Uh, I intend to challenge that. Um, that's enough for tonight. I'm happy to make myself available separately if you all want to get into some nitty gritty details on any of those topics. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. I, I just want you to know that Stephen had asked me ahead of time if he could have more than two minutes because he had lots of items. I thought that was okay. So 
thank you for arranging that ahead of time. Uh, okay, anyone else? Okay, so um, on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the consent agenda passes. All right, so we have a number of appointments to make. Um, so we'll take these uh, in order. I do believe we are going to go into executive session um, to uh, discuss the appointments, even if uh, there's um, fewer people than the number of seats, just so we can do them all together. Uh, but we're going to take them in order. So um, development review board appointments. Um, so I think we have uh, at least one, if not two, people who are here um, for that. So if you are applying for the Development Review Board, why don't you come introduce yourself? Good evening. I'm uh, Rob Goodwin. I've been in Montpelier, I guess, almost two years now. Uh, I've been on the Development Review Board since uh, last summer. Um, it was a one-year term, but the charter was renewed, and I think now we're on track to do a renewal every year. So. Uh, uh, little bit shorter, but um, I've got a background in land surveying. I went to the University of Maine. I uh, got a bachelor's degree uh, and currently work at a wastewater and land surveying firm uh, based in Heinsburg. Uh, we cover an area from uh, Rutland to the Canadian border uh, in a few offices and do uh, subdivisions, land surveying, and uh, wastewater. And uh, so that's what I do every day. Uh, it certainly relates to stuff you see on the board uh, every other week. And um, I always love the opportunity Any questions for Rob? <coughs> okay, great, thank you. All right, welcome. Uh, good evening, Hayden DeBlois. Um, I'm uh, also applying to be on the Development Review Board. Um, I've lived in Montpelier nearly two years now, um, and I'm, um, I work for the state. I've uh, previously served, grew up in Manchester, Vermont, where I served on the Planning Commission, uh, so worked closely with their Development Review Board when I lived there. Um, and uh, did a lot of work on their town plan um, and other uh, revitalization um, going on in their downtown. Uh, went to Middlebury College. Uh, again, now work for the state. A lot of my work deals closely with land use and uh, economic development issues. Um, and just very interested in uh, living and staying in Montpelier and ensuring we have a, a great community and a vibrant downtown and would love to be a part of that. Thank you very much for your consideration. Any questions for Hayden? No, okay. thanks. Thank you. All right, anyone else for the Development Review Board? Okay. All right, so on to the uh, Energy Committee appointments. I think there were a number of people who applied for that. Is anyone here for the uh, Energy Committee? Yeah, if you would uh, come introduce yourself. My name is Peter Lux. I am uh, by profession a conference strategist, that is marketing and um, communication strategy. I work mostly with big companies, but also with small companies on ha helping them figure out how to tell their story, not just about themselves, but also about the people they serve. And I think it has a lot of parallels with what the board needs to be doing in terms of bringing the whole community along in the story of becoming a net zero community. Um, I also have, uh, as earlier in my career, I worked as an interim education director for the Cascade, Cascade Bicycle Club in Seattle, which is the biggest advocacy group for bicyclists in the country. Um, and they've done tremendous work in uh, doing things like making sure that people can get to downtown by bike, connecting bike trails, um, a lot of effort into bicycle education in the schools, etc. Uh, and I, I believe walk, making Montpelier more walkable, more bikeable is one of the ways that will make this a more vibrant and thriving community. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thanks. And what else for the Energy Committee? Okay, uh, so then on to historic preservation. 
questions for that. I think we had, uh, yeah, w welcome. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Strain. Uh, my wife Whitney and I live in the Meadow. Uh, although we're recent uh, transplants from Middlebury, we've lived in Vermont for about three years. I brought a stack of resumes to pass around. Um, I am a third-year law student about to graduate uh, in May, um, but my undergraduate degree is in history. Uh, and I grew up in a place that didn't really have a sense of its history. It didn't really have the kind of uh, historical structures and historical um, sense of itself that Montpelier does. And moving here, I really uh, came to value that and I really <coughs> thought that was an amazing aspect of this town. And every day when I walk to work, I walk past the Elm Street uh, Cemetery and it's just uh, a really, really vibrant sense of the, of the community and I'd like to help protect that. So that's Super. the reason why I'm applying. Thank you all for Great, your thank you. For your Great. Any questions? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, I think is the last one. And I don't, and we only had one application for that, and I don't see Michael here. Um, okay, so do we have a motion to go into executive session? I move we go into executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3 for the purpose of discussing the appointment or employment of a public officer or employee. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we will be right back. Uh, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, so I'm going to do this all at once. Um, I move that we appoint to the Development Review Board Rob Goodwin to a full seat, uh, Claire Rock and Michael Lazorchak to the two alternate seats, to the Energy Advisory Board Diana Chase, Dan Jones, Kenneth Jones, Jose Domingo Aguayo, Sarah Kyer, and Peter Lux, to the Historic Preservation Commission Joseph Strain. Do you want to add anything oh, to that? Right, and uh, uh, we uh, appreciate all of the applications from everyone who uh, took the time to apply. Uh, everyone was uh, very well qualified, and we encourage everyone to continue to uh, participate and, and come to all the meetings, <coughs> regardless of whether you're appointed or not. It's a lot of fun to, uh, to, to hang out and participate. Um, so thank you very much to, to all the applicants. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you again to um, everyone who applied, and um, thank you for your work, and um, hope that, uh, yeah, just reiterating what Glenn said, hope that if you were not uh, appointed that uh, you'll uh, uh, still attend their public meetings. Uh, all right, so on to um, the Green Up Day and Mayfest report. Welcome. Do make, do make sure to pull the microphone down. How's that? We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, Dan Grover, Executive Director of Montpelier Alive. And Nate Hausman. I'm on the board of Montpelier Alive and help coordinate the cleanup day efforts. Vice President. You know, Vice President, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we uh, wanted to give you a quick update. No more than five minutes, I promise. Um, about uh, May Fest and Green Up Day, uh, both of which are happening not this weekend, but next weekend, May 3rd to 5th. Uh, so May Fest is a really exciting weekend. It's sort of the uh, Montpelier start of spring, it feels like a little bit. Um, and it's a weekend where there's about uh, almost two dozen events that happen in Montpelier on one weekend. And Montpelier Alive takes the lead in sort of coordinating the promotional efforts. So uh, most of these events are independently organized, uh, but Montpelier Alive puts a lot of resources behind uh, promoting them. We're doing uh, newspaper, radio, and television advertising uh, and online to get people to come downtown, uh, shop at our merchants, uh, eat in our restaurants, and uh, come check out some of these events. Uh, it's everything from Cinco de Mayo at Julio's to uh, Montpelier, Montpelier Academic 
say that correctly, but the three penny tap room, birthday party, uh, onion river outdoor bike swap. There's the first outdoor farmer's market on State Street. Uh, there's an art walk that's organized by Montpelier Live that's on Friday night from 4 to 8. We have 30 venues this time, which is uh, close to a record number. Excuse me, Dan. I just got a message from someone saying it's super hard to hear, so. speak up hopefully you can hear me and I hope um, <clears throat> you all are familiar with Green Up Day it's the annual statewide effort to to remove litter from Vermont's roadways and it's coordinated on a town by town basis but Montpelier's efforts are particularly robust and I want to share with you a little bit about what we're doing um, this year for two reasons one of course we'd love you to volunteer and participate and pick up litter but also we encourage you to to, um, to encourage your neighbors and friends to, to also participate um, and to volunteer, volunteer too. Um, so if you do want to volunteer, you can come to Montpelier Live's Green Update table at the Farmer's Market. That's, that's the one Dan mentioned, um, the first outdoor one on uh, Saturday, May 4th, between 9 and 1. And we'll provide gloves and bags and recycling bags and help you adopt an area to green up. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll also have coupons for volunteers that can be redeemed at local shops. Um, and volunteers helping to, to, to green up Montpelier can leave their bags curbside within city limits. The uh, Department of Public Works has offered to pick up those bags and, and the, the crew, um, the good crew from the fire department is helping uh, and has agreed to assist with disposing of hazardous materials and, and needles that are found and they're also uh, helping with the green up efforts too. Um, but if you're not able to make it to the farmer's market, you can also uh, grab bags from, from the city clerk's office. Um, and uh, we wanna encourage folks to, we, Montpelier's a little bit unique in that we have our own um, online mapping tool and that allows us to coordinate volunteer efforts in real time so you can claim a roadway and other people can see those roadways. And, uh, and the, it, it allows uh, people to see to, you know, what still needs to be done in, in, in real time. So, more information about that mapping tool is on the flyer and including the, the URLs on that flyer I, uh, I passed around and uh, we'll be, you'll hear more about it on Front Porch Forum and through other venues in the days to come. But I just thought I'd see if there's any questions about Green Up Day. I don't have any questions, but I am psyched <laughs> that it's happening. Glenn, did you have a question? A uh, small question on behalf of my partner, Kate Stevenson. Uh, how many bags are we allowed to take? Because she fills lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, I'm actually picking up more bags from the Green Up Vermont office tomorrow because we do such a, such a good job. Uh, you can take whatever you think you can fill, and we'll, okay. we'll have, uh, have, have those uh, recycling bags available, too. Um, and the more the merrier, the more you're willing to take on, the, the, the better. So there'll be plenty. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I do want to just give a, sh I meant to give a shout out to uh, Nick Flores of Stone Environmental and, and Co. B, uh, B, BBT um, for his help developing that online mapping tool. He did that on a volunteer basis, so it's really cool. That's co very cool. I just uh, wanted Donna, to thank yeah. you for writing this out. This is very helpful. Great. Super. Any uh, further questions? Great. Well, thank Thanks. you both for your work. Um, May is very exciting. Do you have a comment? Would, uh, it's kind of a segue. It's something that I didn't pack into my earlier. Uh, I have done a full circumnavigation of the Shaw's property at the confluence of the river, and I've been being watchful for decades of that uh, confluence and bank. That is a unique problem because it's too steep and hazardous for green up volunteers to manage, but yet there are literally hundreds of pounds of garbage and insulation and uh, damaged racks that are falling into the river. Uh, I, 
I've left several messages for the general store manager. I would ask you to consider council's vote to direct the city manager to write him a letter to take advantage of cleanup day and uh, get ahead of this before it becomes an enforcement action. Um, but I've got plenty of photos to share, but not tonight. Um, hopefully it'll all be clean <laughs> in a week or two. Yes. Uh, that's my suggestion. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Okay, so we are moving on to um, the uh, Five Home Farm Way uh, property discussion, which is actually a quasi-judicial proceeding. Um, so it's a little bit different than our regular um, uh, items. Um, so this is not, strictly speaking, uh, in, uh, a public hearing, um, though the public can comment, but uh, it'll be, if there were members of the public who wanted to testify, it would be, it would be more like uh, testifying rather than just, uh, right, than just uh, coming up to speak. You would be um, asked to um, be under oath, uh, which I will have the um, city clerk administer. Um, I'm gonna, just to tee this up, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bill. Yes, yeah, so this is being conducted under our uh, nuisance ordinance. <laughs> Um, we had a complaint, it's been investigated, and the police chief, uh, excuse me, the fire chief and building inspector have made findings and recommended that the building uh, be considered a public hazard. So under the, our ordinance, this is considered, um, as, as the mayor mentioned, a quasi-judicial hearing. It's solely for the purpose of determining whether the condition of the building constitutes a public nuisance. Uh, and testimony can come from the owner or tenant of the property, city officials and employees, and the public. Con containing relating to the condition of the premises. So anybody who has information about the condition of the premises uh, and whether it is or isn't a public hazard or a public nuisance um, could offer testimony under oath. Uh, the fire chief and building inspector will present their report and findings. They can answer questions. Anyone else who wishes to speak can be sworn in. Any testimony would have to be accepted as evidence. After the record is closed, the council uh, will issue a decision with formal findings. They can try to do that tonight or they can go into deliberative session make a decision and, and release findings uh, later. If they do find it is that it's a public nuisance, it will direct the owner to uh, produce a, a plan for remediation and abatement and they can set a deadline. It has to be at least 10 days, can be as long as they wish, but at some point they'll set a deadline by which the remediation plan has to uh, be in place. Uh, my recommendation to the council will be that given the complexities of this property, specifically the ownership, um, that any condition of a, a res of a remediation plan include one that a demonstration that the party who is submitting the plan has the right and authority to complete any work on the property that they can't just go on somebody else's land and do this that within five days the property be made safe from immediate danger so that there be immediate uh, boarding up or whatever is required and that they provide demonstration of the financial means to complete a full plan within whatever the time they propose to do so something obviously the council can cons consider in, in deliberative session. Um, so with that, I, I would urge the mayor to open the hearing and take the testimony from the staff. And uh, I think we'll probably to do um, the swearing in of everyone all at the same time. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm gonna officially uh, open the um, uh, this public uh, hearing or the proceedings. Um, and uh, John, do you want to, uh, so if you're intending to testify, um, now's gonna be the time, so I'm gonna turn that over to, to John. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, right, great. Thank you, Mayor. Everybody, uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Okay, so I'm gonna, Turn it over to you, um, you all first. So, um, March 18th is form. Just form identify yourselves for the record. What's that? You identify yourselves for sure. the record. Chris Lumman, City Building Inspector. Okay. On March 18th, we perform an inspection at the property of Five Home Farm Way uh, in, in response to a complaint from citizens. <coughs> and we did find quite a bit of evidence that it is not in compliance with the city's nuisance ordinance. Um, I think most of the council members have probably seen the photos and, and 
copy of the report. Um, but uh, and are you offering those photos and report in, into evidence? So the, uh, I, I can accept all the evidence at the end yes. together. Okay, I'm going to do that later. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the violations we found are all, um, this is Article 7 of the City Ordinance and Section 7-701 are definitions of what constitutes a nuisance ordinance. Um, <coughs> in violation of bullet points B and E under that section, numerous window or openings that aren't boarded over, panes are missing, and the building interior is pretty easily accessible in the, in the condition the building's in. Uh, obviously, this is a concern. I mean, anybody could get in there and start a fire or, or <coughs> camp out in there. It's, it's a pretty secluded property, so someone could be in there for a while and not, not detect it. Um, <coughs> Bullet point H of the same se same section. The exteriors unsightly, badly peeling paint. Um, uh, several sections here. This is D, E, and H. Portions of the roof are, are badly sagging. Uh, utilities have been disconnected. Plumbing and heating systems have been removed from the building. The floors are sagging badly in several locations. Uh, there's, there's a lot of framing deficiencies, several locations throughout the building, and there are some framing members are missing, some are rotted, some have been repaired poorly or incorrectly and are undersized with overloaded members throughout the building. Uh, one, one specific post in the basement looks like it's, it's holding up the whole building. It's got a crazy bow in it and I kind of get nervous standing next to it. Foundation shows some evidence of, of moderate to severe, fairly recent movement. And obviously, in, all, in this condition, the building's unsafe for human habitation. Anything to add? Robert Gowans, Fire Chief. The only thing I would like to add is the building, if there were to be a fire in that building, that would be a, a very dangerous and, uh, and uh, huge undertaking. Uh, there's no sheetrock anywhere in that building there's no, all the lath and, or the plaster has been removed so it's pretty much just a wide open wooden structure that would um, would become rapidly consumed in fire it would be a very dangerous situation okay any questions from the council for these folks Jack um, would you say that the photographs that you submitted are, are a fair and accurate representation of the condition of the building on the day that you uh, examined it? Yes. Thank you. And did you notice any uh, settling or anything like that when you were walking around on in the uh, in the building? Yes. Yes. The floors, floors are sagging and settling in various locations throughout the building. You could feel it. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to hang out here or not, either way. Um, comments or a testimony from the uh, public. So you have now four other people that. Yes, who, who raised their hand. So, um, yeah, welcome. Yeah, if you would uh, say your name. Commission discussed it last night. Uh, it's built on the so property of the son of the founder of Montpelier. Uh, it was built in the 1840s. Great, thank you. I know both Joseph and Martin Kemple for many years. Uh, I understand Food Works has been dissolved, and so the title, property, interest, responsibility, liability 
is unclear to me right now. Um, but in light of it being s such a historic building and an important piece of Montpelier's history, I would like to just raise a few issues. Um, a nuisance versus a hazard is unclear to me. The report from the building code classifies it as a class two hazard index. Um, and an attractive nuisance is something I've heard about before. Uh, but apparently, am I allowed to ask a question? Was there any evidence that anyone has been squatting or any personal habitation or fire evidence of burned trash or anything in the building? I think it's a fair question. I, I, or technically, it's not supposed to ask questions. Oh, okay. There was no evidence submitted of any of that. I think you should be offering testimony what, about whether you whether you have information that says this is or is not a nuisance. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm whether it is or is not a nuisance. I guess it depends yes. on who you ask. If you're living right next door or if you have a commercial or uh, potential uh, profit interest in the land or uh, yes, it could be a nuisance to the person living next door. Uh, it also has great potential to the city, both as a historic building restored or even as a uh, rest restored or as a, a shelter for some, some of the folks that are currently living in tents out on the riverbank. Uh, I know it would take some investment to make that happen, um, but I think we should be moving carefully and deliberately to preserve our unique uh, history. Uh, it has good bones, uh, so to speak. It needs lots of investment. Uh, CLC, I would be inquiring of Habitat or other organizations that might take on such a project, uh, provided clear title, the city. Uh, I don't, I haven't heard that it's been proposed for demolition or uh, condemnation or uh, eminent domain. So if, if I may, just to help you and others who may be willing to test interest in testimony, the process is that the council hears evidence on whether it is or not in bad shape. Is it a nuisance? If they determine that it's not, then things just continue as is. If they determine that it is, then they will seek a remediation plan from the owner. Now, there, unfortunately, there's no <coughs> owner. It's owned by Food Works, who doesn't exist. So that's a complicated factor. So presumably any number of folks that you've mentioned would have the opportunity to present, as long as they can show that they have legally authorized to do so, a remediation plan. The City Council can then determine if that's sufficient, whether there's enough finance behind it, whether it's going to solve the problem, and then, and then they will make a decision of whether it would be targeted for demolition or any other such thing. So this is the beginning of a process to determine the future of the property. So, and I, I just wanted to uh, uh, apologize. I had meant to emphasize <laughs> that part, but or um, or really um, to uh, make it clear that that remediation plan, um, if if we decide uh, that it is a nuisance, that will come later. And so we're we're going to try to keep the conversation relatively um, focused on whether or not it's a, a constitutes a nuisance as defined um, in the ordinance. And further discussion um, about remediation can happen um, at a later time should we decide that that is in fact the case. I hope that clarifies um, the the order of things. Narrows, narrows yeah. My comments. Okay. Uh, it's not a nuisance to me. It's a treasure uh, to Montpelier. Uh, if there if there are no people living in it, squatting it, risking burning it down, uh, that should be carefully calculated. In these these are dramatic drastic measures to potentially set something on the road to demolition or acquisition by a uh, private interest uh, that may have motivated uh, this action in the first place. So I'm willing to assist through corresponding with Martin and Joseph and or help boarding it up or whatever you deem, Thank you. deem necessary. of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, I am also a practicing preservation professional. professional. I've uh, been involved with the property 
uh, as a volunteer and a, a paid professional uh, for over 10 years. I've worked uh, on that house uh, with a number of uh, students at the high school. Um, got a grant from the History Channel many years ago uh, and did a timber frame project. The timber frame structure that's out in the agricultural area was one that a number of Montpelier High School students worked on uh, over April vacation uh, many years ago. Um, I, with the clarity you just provided, I have a lot to say, but uh, I'll keep it simply to, um, it is a historic structure. I think there is a lot of intrinsic value there. Uh, it absolutely is in need of attention. I think we all know that uh, it's had uh, suffered a uh, a number of circumstances which has not helped its situation. I will say that I personally have been in discussion with the Preservation Trust of Vermont and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, who both hold easements on the property, um, with an interest in uh, if the ownership and some of the current um, assessed mortgage uh, note that is currently held by the Vermont community um, can be dealt with. Uh, there's a group of folks who have interest in um, starting a nonprofit and perhaps taking over ownership and restoring that building. There's a lot to do in order to get to that place, so I would simply ask for your willingness to allow the process to proceed appropriately and to give it your due consideration. I think it is uh, a really important and unique structure. Uh, it has a great history and uh, it would be a shame to lose it. Uh, it's stood for over 200 years and I hope that um, you know, we can put some attention towards it to have it, uh, in, in, for everyone to enjoy it for a few hundred more. So that's all I just wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you. And I think there was one more if you want to. Brett Connor from uh, Connor Brothers Montpelier Armory LLC, as was mentioned by a previous speaker. I'm the guy next door. Um, we have been uh, neighbors of uh, the Blue Works property for about 20 years. Uh, it's been vacant that entire time. It's been abandoned for at least a half a dozen. Um, and our concern is that we have a substantial investment next door, and uh, believe that it's an easy call for the for the uh, city council to determine that it is a nuisance and see where it where it goes from there. Of uh, disclosure, as Mr. Dugan mentioned, uh, we hold a 99 year rate of first refusal on the property. Um, so I, I have also had discussions with uh, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board uh, and uh, Preservation Trust Vermont uh, about what happens if uh, they do not proceed with, uh, with the project uh, as very publicly announced or presented by Food Works. They had a $2.5 million capital campaign. They raised $800,000, including $250,000 from a widow. Um, and I don't see more than uh, about $100,000 worth of work there that's been done. Um, and it, it, it would have been better if no one had shown up. It's, um, it, there's, there's severe structural uh, mistakes that have been made uh, that we believe render the property uh, not feasible to bring back. It's in the hundreds if not thousand dollars a foot, uh, 10 times what would be feasible for any kind of private enterprise. So I would respectfully request that you d determine it to be a, uh, a nuisance uh, and see where that, see where it goes from there. I did have one question. I'm wondering if any city officials actually reached the owner, because I understand this is a discussion between the city and the owner, and the owner is delisted by the Secretary of State's office, but has a contact person in Waterbury that I provided to the city um, and just curious whether that, whether anyone was able to reach uh, the, the, owner. the, the owners, the corporation all said that they were no longer involved. With Pardon? The owners, the former cor corporate members all said that they were no longer involved with this property and did, had no longer had interest so in it. So who, who will the city communicate with then since this is directed at the owner? I, I didn't do it personally, so I'll get back to you on that. Pardon? I didn't do that personally. I'll get back to you on that. I know we reached out through okay. staff and yeah, the, the name, just for people's information, the name that I provided is listed in the Secretary of State's office as the member for continuing correspondence post 
dissolution. So th there, was a, there was a party that's supposed to be, uh, I guess, answerable through the Secretary of State's office. And you provided that to the city? Uh, some, did, did you send that as an email? I'm not sure I... I did provide that. To okay. Yeah. And um, Jack? That would be uh, Cindy Senning, who's listed on the uh, Secretary of State's a page. A Waterbury PO? Yes. Yes. As business point of contact following dissolution or withdrawal for purposes of service of process? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jack, can you just help me out? What is that document? Um, I'm sorry. I, I <coughs> knowing this was coming up, I went to the Secretary of State's web page to uh, look up the corporation, and this is a record from the Secretary of State's page. It shows that the corporation was dissolved and the last year it filed an annual report was 2014. And uh, the registered agent was Martin Kempel with Cindy Senning, or Lucinda Senning of Waterbury, listed uh, as the Kay. point of contact for post dissolution action. And that's about it. Okay. Um, yes, Fred. I'd just like to add just one brief uh, item. Um, following up on uh, Jack's comments, uh, I believe, and I'm not an attorney, but I believe under the public trust doctrine, uh, they actually cannot fully dissolve. They may have dissolved in the eyes of the Secretary of State's office, but they cannot completely disband without the transfer of this asset. That's what, that's what I've been told multiple times. And just to clarify, um, Fred, the... Um, the document that you sent to the city you're also submitting as evidence? Pardon? The, the document that you sent to the city you're also submitting as evidence? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. I th um, anyone have anything further to add? Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just an observation. Uh, I've learned recently that nonprofits, which I know Food Works was, can, under tax law, cannot transfer assets to commercial interests only to other similarly purpose nonprofits. So that may have some bearing on how this gets proceeded with. Okay. Thank you. I just confirmed that um, the notices for this were sent to that address in Waterbury. Okay. I'm sorry, Bill, I didn't hear what I said confirming for the record that all notices about this proceeding were sent to that address in Waterbury, the post dissolution address. And we um. received no correspondence back from anybody related. We also spoke with the, I believe, the former chair of the board, uh, Scott Cameron, who is himself an attorney, who said they had nothing to do with it, um, that they were done and out of it. Jack. Just checking in the notice, in addition to food works at the post office box we have, went to the Community Loan Fund, the Housing and Conservation Board, and the Pr Preservation Trust of Vermont. Was there any uh, response from any of them? The only response we received in writing um, was from the Housing Conservation Board saying they wouldn't be attending tonight, but hope something could work out. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. And do we assume that um, some or all of these entities have uh, have mortgage liens on the property? Do we, I didn't check. So sworn in, but sure. Well, you can get sworn in. Can we join with the line? Solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under the king's penalty of perjury. I do. Um, the letter did go to, to the uh, person that uh, Fred kind of was asking about. And in fact, <coughs> excuse me, we spoke with that woman directly as well. We also did speak with Scott Cameron from Food Works, who was the former chairman. We sent the letter to everyone who has any sort of an easement, a historical or a, a conservation easement on that property as well. Um, the city did not try to determine ownership. We've tried to reach out to everybody who has some piece of the property or some legal piece of the property uh, and have asked them to spread it as spread the word as well. And did we get confirmation back that the uh, certified mail that we sent out was delivered? Yes, and we've actually spoken with everybody on that list several times since the piece went out. 
including the pre uh, preservations class. We sat down with all those players around the table on multiple occasions, and we'll continue to do so. Mm -hmm. And the, the certified mail receipts are in the record. Trust and have been working on this project, and we've been having meetings trying to resolve the issue. As Bill said so well, there's a number of issues, <laughs> legal issues that need to be resolved before this really yep. goes anywhere. So again, I would focus the, yep. the hearing. The hearing today is to determine whether the, the building, as it exists, is a public nuisance. It's not here to determine the legal wranglings amongst the various parties. I think, as the city, we was tempted to stay out of that to the extent possible. And we'll accept, uh, you know, any testimony about the condition of the building. As I said, if the council makes a determination that it's a nuisance, then the owner um, or someone who can demonstrate that they have the ability to, to and the authorization to do this work can provide a mitigation plan. The council can consider that plan, and at the, you know, hopefully uh, involved parties will collaborate on doing that if it gets there. But at this point, that is really not. That's beyond the scope of this particular hearing. Okay. And we have one more. D would you like to be sworn in, sir? Yeah. Do you mind? Is there anyone else who would like to be sworn in? No? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Hi, I'm Paul Hill. I'm the Director of Housing and Community Facilities Programs at the Vermont Community Loan Fund. We're currently the first mortgage holder on the property along with the mortgage that's existing with the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Their mortgages are actually subordinate to us, but the covenants they hold are uh, those that we're subordinate in our position to. I just wanted to let the, the record show that we have currently have a mortgage balance outstanding of about $90,000 for the month. We work with the organization known as Food Works and the Two Rivers, the, the Two Rivers Center for Sustainability, I believe, is what they uh, eventually evolved. We are the record lien holder. We are not the title owner. We have not exercised our rights or remedies under the mortgage deed. Uh, we would, again, establish our willingness and flexibility to see this property put back into community service. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, anything further? Okay, uh, so I am going to um, accept as evidence all of the um, uh, attachments that were submitted to the city um, that are available online as well as uh, the document um, uh, referenced by uh, Fred Connor. Uh, and I think that constitutes everything. And I'm gonna um, close the, um, the record uh, on this and then also um, close the, um, the hearing. Um, so at this point, um, well, <laughs> uh, at least as far as this process goes, the council will need to enter into a deliberative session, um, which we could do tonight, but we don't have to do it tonight. It might just depend on, yeah, um, uh, it might be later. But then I think we have a certain amount of time in which we are um, obligated to um, issue a decision. And so we will, um, I'm not sure what the time is on that, but we'll, we'll find that out and be within it. And... Uh, I think that is, is that's it for now, um, and we'll we'll see where we're at after the the decision is made through deliberative session. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Jack. When you say deliberative session, are you saying executive session? You're not, right? I'm not saying You're executive. You're just saying executive at some deliberative point session. from now or at any time in the future, we could choose to enter into a deliberative session. Yes. I suggest we do it now. <laughs> well, you could maybe do it at the end of the meeting. That's, That's what fine I, too. Yeah, yeah I, I would suggest, assuming that we end relatively early and we're not all falling asleep, then um, tonight would be great. Let's aim to do that. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, all right, so we're on to the ordinance amendments. Um, how are you doing, team? Do you need a break? Are you doing okay? Move forward. I'd what do you think? A quick break, just to get. Yeah. Okay, to let's take five, um, and we'll be back shortly. The one piece I neglected to mention on the last item, but just to be clear, shh. 
Um, and I know some Thanks. of this has inadvertently already happened, but because this is not, uh, because this is a matter of deliberative session and quasi-judicial, actually, unlike a political issue, you really should not be discussing this with people until a decision's been issued. So ex parte conversation with a decision-making board, just like the DRB, and uh, you know, I, I, nobody had bad intent, but I know it just occurred, and um, so you should, if someone comes up to you to lobby on this issue, um, you really should decline to have that conversation, so. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, we are moving on to um, uh, the ordinance amendments. Uh, we are uh, going through our ordinances, doing a little cleaning up of them. Um, so we're taking it one chapter at a time, and so um, we're looking at chapter one right now. Um, so I know I have uh, just a couple of questions about some of the changes. I would love to not necessarily go through all of them. Um, so let's yeah. so let's assume that um, uh, we're only going to talk about the ones that you want to point at and say you know what's up with that. Um, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So if I may, this was a uh, this was on the uh, uh, priority list, the the strategic plan for this current year. And uh, we spent a fair amount of time going through all of these, including uh, a whole afternoon meeting with uh, Paul Giuliani, Tony Fakus, Jamie, Sue, I, I'm trying to think if someone else was there, and literally going through the entire ordinance book and making marks, then sharing each section with appropriate departments that it involved, and then going back and looking at their comments and sending it back to the attorney. So it was quite a long process. Uh, it's finally found its way to you. Having done all that, there's still one huge piece that we, we, we need to get back to you on then, and that is in, in with uh, chapter one. Doesn't mean you can't do your work tonight, but we will be back to you is that we, uh, under 1.9, the general uh, penalty and continuing violations, we're actually gonna rework that to make these all civil violations and uh, consistent with current uh, law, so there'll be a whole new section on that with specific penalties, so, um, that will just come to you when we're in the process of drafting it now and having it reviewed. So when it's ready, we'll get it back to you before final adoption of all of this. And then I think the plan is that we would go through each of these. This is the first reading of the ordinance. Um, next week would be the second reading. You could go ahead and adopt what you change. We'll just come back and do this one later. Uh, and then next week or the next meeting, you'll have the first reading of chapter two along with second reading of chapter one. So we'll always be doing two. Otherwise, um, we're here to answer any questions. So before I forget, I just want to officially open the public hearing on this. Okay, any questions or comments on the proposed changes? Uh, Lauren. Um, two things I was wondering about. So in section 1-3 definitions, um, it says or and near the bottom. And to me, or and and are very different in policy matters and this says you can kind of interchange them and I would rather be clear are we saying an or or an and like do you need to meet all conditions or just some I was thinking of that uh, serial comma case in, <laughs> in Maine that they got in trouble over some lack of clarity um, so I might just strike that and as we're going through if <coughs> if we mean or we should put or and if we mean and we should put and um, can you, I'm sorry, can you just Where? clarify? Oh, oh, or, and, okay, I found you. So you're just saying, strike that, we should be just be clear whether we mean or, and. That's Thoughts on that? My recommendation. Well, which is meant in this incident? Well, this is, is a definition. This is a definition, and it's saying that you can read them interchangeably in the text, which could change meaning in my mind, if yeah, you th are thinking and, or you're thinking or. So, okay. So this is first reading, so we could flag that and get yeah. feedback on that for second reading. That, does that sound the reason okay for two readings? For okay. Good, catch. Great. Uh, Jack. Uh, before all of my other comments, I, I do have a general question that I just wanna flag for the council to see, you know, get a temperature of the body and that is that in the, when we're doing this uh, rewrite, do we want to take on the
project of doing a more substantial rewrite to eliminate the uh, turgid legalese that appears pretty much throughout <laughs> and convert it to language that people can understand. Um, it's obviously a bigger project, but as an example, in uh, section 1.9b, I came across the phrase, in addition to the penalty here and above provided. And <laughs> I think there's a lot of stuff like that that's challenging to read. Um, I'm fine with not making this wholesale, doing a big change like that now, but I at least want to flag that so we're considering whether we want to do that or not. Obviously, it's a lot more work than has already been put into it. Fair, fair question. Uh, Glenn. Uh, I support the idea of, of making things more readable to the general public entirely. Um, while at the same time, I kind of appreciate the, the all the <laughs> syllables that they managed to squeeze in there, but that may be <laughs> partly because it's not uh, not something that I run across all the time, so it, it has some novelty to me. Uh, but yeah, I'd be in favor of full uh, clarification, taking out legalese. Uh, Donna. Uh, Jack, are the legalese phrases that you're finding readily available that you could find an option to this do a, re a fast replacement? Probably like not. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <but> no, <laughs> it's, it's like sentence by sentence, section by section, and, uh, and so I, d I didn't go through to flag each particular one for the very reason that I don't know whether people want to do that or not. You know, there's a whole m movement in legal writing for writing in plain English, and um, no, it certainly was not the way it was done when I started practicing law, but to the extent that we can do it, I think it's a good thing, but I don't know whether we want to want to spend the time doing it. Yeah, go ahead. Can you, can you estimate at all how much staff time that would take? Or are you volunteering? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, let me think about that before okay. our next reading. Well, okay. and I, I think that's a fair question to continue to think about. I mean, uh, if, if it seems as though there is a, an easy way to fix, a, you know, here, here to four above, I'm, I just missed it, or whatever it is, if, if it seems obvious to you that there's um, a simpler way to say it, then this is why we have two hearings, and, you know, we, let's, let's bring that up. But... Um, and then we can we can have it you know sufficiently reviewed. But I would I would assume that to go through it uh, at the level you're suggesting would take much more time. But I could be wrong about that. I think you're probably right. It would be yeah. <laughs> uh, Lauren, um, one way I mean I know that you know some of the changing the genders and stuff in here. I know that you know when we work at the state house, there's typically an approach of if you're opening up and looking at and updating. Um, an ordinance, for example, that we could have a goal to also clean up um, at the time if there's something that sticks out. I mean, I would just worry that, like, the strict legal meaning, it wouldn't be as simple as just, you know, is that word substitute changing the meaning in a substantive way? So I don't know that it would be a quick and easy mm -hmm. thing to do. I think it could be laborious, but we could certainly have a goal to everything that we're writing is <laughs> like that. And if there's way, if sections are being updated and there are easy fixes that we could aim for that, but just a thought. Does that seem fair for now, Jack? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for raising it, though. Um, any, I have a couple questions. Um, uh, one is in um, section 1-7, uh, where did it go? <coughs> just lost it. Uh, I think it's H, or it was H. It's now parts of it are changing. Oh, yep, it, it was H and now it's F, uh, potentially. Um, it says otherwise, or, or I'm sorry, unless otherwise provided therein, an ordinance shall take effect uh, 60 days instead of 30 days. And I just was curious um, why the change from 60 to 30? 
So I don't know that answer, and, and I just saw that actually yesterday 30, myself. 30 I to 60. 30 I said the to 60, and 30 I don't 60. know. I think it should be whatever the, the charter says. Did do Paul you want to come up, it? Jamie? <laughs> Again, we can check that for the next reading, because I think our charter is pretty specific about when things okay. take effect. Okay. Okay. I mean, if it's to. I can ask him about it. Cool. Yeah. If it's to be in line with our charter, great. Yeah. Awesome. I don't know that it is, but. Um, okay. I guess I, I had a couple other questions um, about um, Section 17C, which I think was about um, uh, if we change anything in the ordinances. It's, it's like how it would be no, noted, um, but we just took that out. So it, at, uh, if we do make amendments further to this, is there any way that we would be signifying how um, ordinances are changed? If not, that's fine. I just am clarifying. I think we were just taking out the, you know, the very specific wording of how the motion is supposed to be for, you okay, know, so you know, clearly there's, uh, you know, rules for amending ordinances that's okay. clear. Just this was sort of saying, here's exactly how you have to make this motion. Okay. Um, it still talks about how people can propose in writing other changes. And okay, thank you for that clarification. That that works for me. Um, and the charter is very clear that the council can enact or amend any ordinances. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, Donna. Uh, I actually like the 60 days. I hope it stays because I feel people <laughs> need more notice when you make these changes. And the other thing, including the uh, restorative justice, I don't know if that came from you or Paul, but that was really good to see. Uh, Glenn and I are fighting over district <laughs> uh, streets, but uh, have we settled that one yet? Who owns State Street? <laughs> I thought I had one side. <laughs> and he only has like a couple corner or whatever oh, and that most of it's <laughs> state street the, the, where the district line is yeah oh, that's, that's firm I, can, I don't have it on me the language in here John, we're not talking to you now. is questionable <laughs> but it's it's the language from the char from the charter not the ordinances that, that that matters i believe well we want them to match yeah no we actually looked very closely at there were some issues between district 2 and district 3 when i first got here and we went back and dug all the way back through the, the, the charters, going back into the changes through the 70s. So we do have firm lines, and I can get that. Okay, well, all, all my maps show that I have one, I, District 1, has <laughs> one side of State Street. Mm -hmm. And this puts uh, uh, even and odd numbers mm -hmm. in District 3. Why are you all are talking? Why don't I just go No, so, the, yeah, it just says even and odd numbers up to a certain number, then right. everything beyond that is... Right, that but right. Uh, my, my maps show me I come down half of Main Street. Why don't we go just check on this corner, and come back? Yeah, and yeah. one yeah. side I mean it's, it's firm, whatever yeah. it is, I can check. We'll on check it. on it though. That sounds good. Yeah, Glenn, did you have something to follow up with or no? Um, I think a check is necessary, and that's all on that. There are a few <laughs> other uh, things that I'd like to check about. Um, Section one three. I just have a preference. Uh, I the I'm happy that we're switching from councilman to something else. Uh, I don't really love council member, uh, and I'd like to consider councilor with an O R at the end. I hear that that may not jibe with the the charter. I'd like to see what other councilors think about that, or council members, whichever <laughs> you think of yourself. <laughs> I will probably continue to refer to people to counselor regardless, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Donna? I assumed that counselor wasn't regularly used because of the confusion with lawyers. They're also referred to as your counselor. Are they not in court? No. Sometimes, yeah, or counsel, but yeah, spelled not, not spelled the same way, but the sounding the, the, the same. Charter, our charter just referred, so it used to be aldermen, yes. and they changed it to council members, and that's what the as long as I've been here, it's been council members, and that's what the signs have all said, yep. and that's what we've yep. used. Uh, that I, but I think you can refer to yourselves as really anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the, for the point of of the step, the ordinances, we thought it should be consistent with the charter. Charter, okay. I, yeah, I agree. I think that makes sense. Uh, 
Okay, any further? Yeah, Jack. Oh, and then Connor. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, so many people. Glenn okay, was going gosh. through a bunch, so why don't we? Yeah, yeah I, um, I still have a few. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, on. Glenn, and then let's go Connor, and then over to Jack. Is that okay? Okay. Um, there was a question I had about, I have to find it, unfortunately. Um, section 19D. Uh, completion of a restorative process, the, the bit that we're adding, un underlined in red. Um, so, the amount of a waiver penalty for a first violation of any section enumerated herein shall be $50 or at the election of the violator, completion of a restorative process with the Montpelier Community Justice Center and completion of restorative process is certified by Montpelier Community Justice Center. And that just doesn't scan to me. Uh, it seems like uh, we could s get the same meaning by saying completion of a restorative process which shall be administered and certified by the Montpelier Community Justice Center. So um, that's true. And I just say that we're going to be actually redoing the whole one point. That's the section we're going to be doing in all over in its entirety to change the not only the fine amounts but the process and the how, how the Justice Center because we have to build in a fee stru structure for the Justice Center process and um, make it more consistent with what they call the municipal traffic. Blah, blah, blah. So we can issue civil tickets for these violations rather than having to prosecute them in district court. Great. Uh, and actually, scrolling down through, since we're going to check up again about the district lines, I don't have anything else. Okay. Connor. Uh, right. Two very quick questions. Uh, since we mapped out the districts originally, it's probably for John, has there been any population fluctuation that we've needed to adjust this, do you think, or pretty steady and even with the three of them? Well, the last time that was done was um, not very long ago. It was about six years ago. Oh, um, so, you know, I don't, so all I would have to be able to do is guess, and I would guess yeah. no. Okay. So we did do a process, and we did actually adjust the district. That's where this little jut out from yep. District 3 onto State Street was added to add that District 3 had less population than the other districts, so that was added to balance the population. Great. Other quick question. Uh, same piece that the mayor raised initially. I'm assuming an ordinance can be effective upon passage if we specify it with that good number? So, uh, so I think um, we'll check this with, with legal. Uh, I believe actually our charter talks about when ordinances are effective, and so that would be the guiding okay. principle. So we just want to make sure this is consistent with the charter. Ten days. It's ten days, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, Jack. All right. I have a few more. Um, section 1.3 in the definition of council member. Um, it uh, says. <laughs> Good point. Wherever the council see. word council is used, uh, uh, council. Council member shall mean any person elected to that office. It occurred to me since we have a provision for appointment of members in the case of a vacancy yep. that it should be appoint elected or appointed. Yep. Okay. Does that nullify all your votes last <laughs> 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 Yeah, right. No, this, now I'm elected, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, Good catch. Thank you. Going down in the... Uh, in the definition section, there's a section, there's a definition for public place. And one of the second sentence in there, in that definition, is not something that's proposed to be changed, but it's very hard for me to understand because it says in its entirety, a place visited by many persons and usually accessible to the neighborhood public. And I wonder if anyone in the process of looking at these revisions, read that and has a theory of what it means. <laughs> I think we missed that one. If, if I can. You can Google it. I, I can come up with, <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah, I can make a proposal for our next time. <laughs> sure. Um, um, do you mean next, at the next reading? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if this will help, but I had, I was curious about that too. That feels, that whole section feels to me like three alternate definitions, yeah. although they're 
sort of only very slightly alternate, that none of them are complete sentences. Is it, is, is your problem about it that, that it isn't a complete sentence or that it's not clear enough compared to the other two? The second one. So I'll come up with something. Yeah. Um, we have um, a, de a definition for residence and uh, shall be construed to mean the place mostly not being changed, the place adopted by a person as their place of habitation and to which whenever they are absent they have the intention of returning and um, the clerk may be aware of this, there's a bit of a kerfuffle up in the town of Victory uh, where there were a whole bunch of people who were added to the checklist as being residents because there were people who lived, didn't live, even live in Vermont. They bought property in Vermont and they said, well, I'm, I'm buying property in, in Victory and I have my intention at some point in the future to have this be my residence. And I believe a bunch of people were allowed to uh, to vote, and then it got uh, it was it was challenged, and I think it was a peculiar interpretation by someone at the Secretary of State's office. It's a very broad interpretation, let's put it that way. Yeah, and uh, my understanding for um, for many years of the legal interpretation of residence or domicile includes not just your intent that it be uh, where you reside, but it includes physical presence as part of it. So you can't say, my intention is to live over there somewhere, and that's, that's gonna be my residence. I would just say that's not exactly the case. Um, for example, voters overseas will consider um, you know, a, a place that they're not living back at, ho at, back at home as their domicile. But the, um, so, it, so it does get a little fuzzy, but of course the overall intent is that you not be able to vote in two places, um, in, two, in two equivalent jurisdictions, in two, uh, two towns, for example. So it's got to okay. pick one. There's also an issue, of, and again, this is a little bit more specific than John's example, but you know, somebody has a fire and they have to move out of their house, maybe move to a neighboring town for a period of time. They say, well, I tend to move back to Montpelier, but I can't live there for now until. Oh yeah, that's, that's, e yeah, that's an easy right. one, I think, yeah. Um, in so so I was just raising the question: Do we want to clarify this further because of that situation, or are people happy with with it the way it is, pretty much? And I kind of ask the clerk if you think there's it's an issue. Off the top of my head, I would say probably not. I might want to think about that more. Okay. <laughs> John? Likewise, John, is there not a clearer definition when it comes to voting and what is defined as residency allowing someone to vote? Or, or is voting depending on this definition? It's, it, it's not much of a definition, and it only exists in one place, but it, it really comes down to where you designate your domicile. It's all about the domicile, and you get to pick as long as um, it's, it's defensible. Time. Yeah. Um, but again, that was a line that didn't have any meaning at all until the victory case that uh, the Jack mm -hmm. is talking about, and I should probably review that a little more closely to to see what they uh, what they worked out because there was some specificity added. So with our taxes, it says it, it requires you right six months or more. Isn't that a definition they use for uh, income taxes? I'm not sure. That's certainly a so. question they ask. Mm -hmm. Must be. Yeah, I'm not the sure. The homestead. Uh, Glenn. Uh, in our definitions here, it does say, the, the last sentence is, when a person eats at one place and sleeps at another, the place where such person sleeps shall be deemed their residence. That feels like it does at least modify the previous sentence and, and help keep it difficult to claim that your residence in, is in some other town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is adequate. Uh, that, uh, no, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, again, people sleep all over the place. They go on <laughs> vacations. They, you know, I, that, that does, that makes me nervous. Even primarily, you have folks, again, overseas, yeah. people who are, you know, deployed overseas um, for extended periods. Um, you know, those, they are still registered to vote, for example. In their in what they designate as their hometown, so I think that's actually problematic. So maybe, yeah. Can you look at it? Yeah, I'll look back? at that. Yeah, okay. it needs to be played with. Yeah. Okay. Almost done. <laughs> um, section seven or section one dash seven C is this provision for um, how people uh, propose. Ad to adopt, alter, amend, or amend or repeal ordinances. It requires all such proposals to be submitted in writing and signed by a member of the council, which I don't recall ever seeing anyone do that, not only when I've been on the council, but the entire time I've been coming to council members and seeing discussions. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think you're right. So we could just say, could just say, shall be offered at a regular meeting by a member thereof. Yeah. yeah okay. Ask his, <laughs> ask his phrase. Yeah. Well, I just this is what it says. I'm just I, I know, taking I out the. Yeah. Just ask. By a member. <laughs> by a member, we could take the thereof out. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, th this by is a council member. This is legalese, but I'll just point Same. out in uh, in 7D, which used to be 7F, the, uh, this is also something that hasn't been changed, but the word on the last line, um, of the, or the, the last word on the first line, therefore, should be the therefore without the E at the end. So the proposal therefore shall be changed? Is that the one you're reading? Okay. Yes, because what it's saying is, <laughs> in all proceedings to alter or amend an ordinance, the proposal for altering am or amending the ordinance. So, therefore, without the E at the end. Wow. Oh. Cool. That's fancy. Take I, have I support that. Therefore, and therefore. That's great. Any, uh, any further? Suggestions there? Yeah, well, the one I, I, it was a question, and it might not be a big deal, but it seems to be relevant uh, to our discussion today. At the bottom of uh, Section 1-9, um, there's a state law reference on the Council's power to, power to abate nuisances, and that's proposed to be deleted, and I'm curious why. Is that something from because uh, we Because we... Um, because we added our own, own ordinance. ordinance. Okay, I'm fine, fine with that. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Lauren. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Jamie for going through, I had a lot of tedious typo -y commas, him, hers that I caught and stuff. So thank you, Jamie, for your work incorporating a bunch of very minor edits. And in that vein, just one other thing, we, on, Page two near the top, there's a like um, the third line down. It's one BSA chapter three. Just flagging that throughout, we use sometimes use that like fancy section symbol. Sometimes we reference laws like this. We reference them different ways in different sections throughout. So if we're trying to make it more consistent, we could try to make all of those references in a similar format. Okay. Thank you. All 21. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any um, further comments from the public? Um, as a communication professional, I would like to add my support to the call for plain language. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it should state the document that matters to people in the community who should be able to understand it. Second of all, as we heard tonight, Without plain language, there's a lot of uncertainty about what it actually means. And third, uh, people who have adopted 
plain language. I've actually found it's not that hard to do if they understand what they're reading. Um, and often the legalese is not necessary. Uh, so I would say um, give it a try. And as an added bonus, I would say that if you go try to do plain language, it will become very obvious what's not clear in the ordinance. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Okay. Uh, further comments? Council? No? Okay. So I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, and we've got a lot of things to check on, I think, for next time. So um, I, yeah, I'm not looking at it right now, but do we need to set the next public hearing f um, for the it's next already, well, week sure, you or the next, the next uh, meeting? meeting. Um, do we need a, a motion to that effect? I think we do. I think we move, do. Move sure. to set a second reading for, um, is it our uh, next meeting this, uh, no, it's a May 8th meeting, okay. It is May 8th. I'll second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And we will also be having our first reading of um, chapter, chapter two, two at that meeting. Okay. So um, to yes. toward that vein, uh, Council Member Hurl, just remember that if you catch things that are easy to fix, please send them in in advance so we can just correct them so we don't have to. Correct the E. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If, if so, therefore, we don't have to uh, <laughs> make the corrections at the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was uh, trying to comply with the open meetings. <laughs> yeah, fair. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. Therefore. Uh, okay. Um, so, we're not doing the TIF uh, validation resolution this evening. So, we are just about done. So we're going to move on to council reports. Um, Lauren, can we start with you and go around this way? Um, sure. I would just report um, that we are tomorrow. Uh, yeah, tomorrow evening, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee is meeting, um, working on hopefully adopting our strategic plan. Um, so I thanks for some of the feedback um, you all gave, and if people want to. Um, come that meeting should be really interesting and hopefully we'll be able to build on the work that happened at the strategic planning and all of that so um, look out for that I'll share what comes out of that with, with you all soon Thanks. Cool. just before our meeting tonight uh, council member Hurl and I went to the uh, police department to have a tour of the facility and a presentation by the chief about uh, the work they do and Without going to too great depth, I'll just say, as with every department we meet with, I continue to be impressed by the quality and dedication of the personnel and the work they do. Great. Go ahead. Um, I've been hanging out recently at the T.W. Wood Gallery, where I'm uh, on the board as a member of council here. Um, they're continuing to do great work and are moving forward quickly with the construction of a new elevator for the building, uh, for the Center for Arts and Learning. Um, so I urge you all to go check it out. It should be uh, installed, I think, June 1st. And uh, as a, a collection of uh, scrappy nonprofits, uh, they're always in need of assistance, so I uh, also encourage you to, to <laughs> consider donating. Um, and uh, I think the only thing I have to say otherwise is that I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning as usual, 8.30 to 9.30, if anyone has any uh, conversation they'd like to share. I look forward to it. All right. A couple of people have been asking about uh, scooters, so uh, I... Checked in with Sue today, um, did have a conference call with the company Bird who came in for the pilots. Um, and uh, Bird um, in their operations division did determine that Montpelier did um, not warrant the size uh, to continue operations. I, I think that largely has to do with um, Burlington deciding to go with another company uh, for their scooters and electronic bikes. 
That said, at a meeting very soon, we'd like to present the analytics um, from the pilot project, which will be available, as well as the survey results uh, from 116 people uh, who were users of the scooters there. Um, I think we need to have a good public input process on this, and I think Burlington's actually been doing a pretty good job on that, um, and we can look at it, but cer certainly uh, if we make the determination that we want to bring scooters or electric bikes back, uh, we'd likely be going with another company, and there are other companies interested, so I'll uh, keep you posted. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, last evening, the regional, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission's TAC meant, and there are some elements that are happening that you all need to be aware of. One is the ledge on exit six of I-89. Work will start soon of blowing that stone away, so it will impact traffic on I-89 going both directions, but definitely north. So stay posted on that because the bypass is really long. Um, and likewise, there is a real need. We have acquired unmanned aircraft. And there's that gender thing, but <laughs> it's uh, drones. And we have a department within the Vermont uh, Agency of Transportation that deals with these drones. And they would do things like survey this building, let you know what's going on around it if you needed to do something that was off hands. Uh, they do bridges, they do emergency, they had lots of shots of the recent flooding in Stockbridge. So, but they do have a call out to the public. When you own a drone as a private person, you still have to obey FAA's rules. And they're very uh, strict. And unfortunately, a lot of people buy a drone or give a gift to it somebody, and they don't tell them there are rules here that you have to follow. And one that I think is really important, even with the emergency crews, you have to have the drone in visual contact at all times. And so it takes really three people to have one drone up in the air. It's, it's really amazing, and sometimes four. Um, so that is something that's there, but please, if you own one or you know someone who owns one, tell them to go to the, the Agency of Transportation site and read the rules. Uh, likewise, uh, Cross Vermont Trails did a report, the bridge is going to be happening, but unfortunately, due to the tariffs on steel, it's now going to cost them uh, nearly twice as much. So they're raising more capital. They're raising more capital, but it is coming. Ver Waterbury is going through their own dig that will start and go for two years on their main street and underground utilities. So we're not going to be the only ones dug up. <laughs> And the other thing is, I believe you all got an invitation from Lost Nation Theater. And tomorrow night, they have a gala around the Hitchcock-like thriller, mystery, uh, Turn of the Screw. And, and it starts at 6.30 as a reception. And if you aren't familiar with the Vermont author who's going to be speaking there, see if I can do his name justice, Chris Bojalian. Bojalian? OK. Bojalian. Something like that, okay. And tomorrow or Friday? Friday, Friday, thank you for the correction, Friday. Friday night at 6.30, uh, Chris will start speaking. His books are wonderful, but he's an absolute delightful speaker. So please consider coming. It will be a real treat to have you there and it'll be a great experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, I just want to um, uh, let folks know that um, the, uh, uh, Pocket Park that is next to um, downtown Tees um, in the what well, was a vacant lot. Um, uh, we've had lots of discussion as a council about um, uh, uh, whether or not we um, ought to be um, paying for uh, uh, leasing that space um, and. Um, it's it's very possible that in the near future um, we the city um, may have that structure evicted, and um, so if that is the case, then um, we may be looking for a new home for um, some of that um, that structure. Uh, but I would also like to just put it on your radar, um, uh, dear council, that uh, we may want to talk about um, uh, supporting uh, a pocket park. No, I'm sorry, not park, it is a park park. I'm um, sorry, supporting a parklet um, sort of in that same general vicinity because that is a nice place for people to um, 
hang out and gather and rest. And if that structure needs to move, um, it might uh, be in our uh, interest to to talk about uh, what what uh, would replace it in that same general vicinity. So I just want to put that on your radar as something to talk about um, in the upcoming um, future. Uh, so just be thinking about that. And um, that is it for me for now. Um, John. I realize everybody's excited to get out of here at a reasonable time, so I can give you all an update on the non-citizen voting charter thing or, or not. Yes or no? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Here's an update. <laughs> um, uh, so the uh, proposal was modified um, significantly in terms of the language, but not significantly in terms of the content by the uh, House uh, Government Operations Committee, and they passed it out favorably last week, last Tuesday, with an overwhelming vote. It was, it was uh, like eight to three, I think. It was terrific. They were very enthusiastic about it. And then last Thursday, it passed on the floor, and it's finally starting to get a little of attention, which is interesting. Um, but also, the vote on the floor was, uh, I think it was 95 to 47? 46. 46? OK. That was <laughs> close. <laughs> and there were several uh, members who were not, uh, not there, and just looking at them, you can sort of make some assumptions safe assumptions probably about how their votes would have been. So probably it looks like it was a veto-proof majority. Um, so that's extraordinary, I mean, considering mm -hmm. what, where we thought this was going to be and where I thought it was going to be. So now it's, it's over to the Senate, and the Senate is, I think if it gets to the Senate floor, it's, it's going to have a really strong chance of, of passage and a, probably a strong chance of also having a veto-proof majority. Um, but it needs to go through the Senate Government Operations Committee, and that could be, we'll, you know, we will see. That might be more challenging, or it might not be. But I am meeting with um, um, Senator uh, Polina and uh, Senator Jeanette White, who chairs uh, Senate Government Operations, tomorrow at noon. And I'm also meeting with someone from the governor's office tomorrow morning, because he has finally spoken a bit about it, and he's concerned that it would run afoul of uh, a law uh, recently passed about keeping databases of non-citizens. Um, just so you all know, the, the quick and short answer to that concern is that I think, you know, technically <coughs> the database that would be kept is not, not a database of non-citizens, but it would be a database that is inclusive of non-citizens. But the really more meaningful answer is that the uh, charter change is statute. It would simply be new statute that would be carving out a, an exception if, if there is, a fa in fact, a conflict there. So shouldn't be an issue. We'll see, because obviously we are getting into it, it. There is a policy question, as much as I would like to frame it as this is about how Montpelier chooses to run its own affairs. Um, but that's where we're at. One thing that's potentially good is that Senate Government Ops is an afternoon committee. So they've had caffeine? <laughs> well, th a, a, time, a time comes in the legislature, <laughs> and it'll, it's going to be coming pretty soon, where they uh, shut down the morning committees. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, having it be in an afternoon committee increases our likelihood of getting it acted on this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So I've got a few things. Um, first, thank you all for participating in the strategic planning last week. Uh, we just got the draft report. We're going through that. We'll get that out to you as soon as we can. Hopefully, we'll have a formal version on the next agenda to vote <coughs> and approve. Um, any feedback that you have, I'd be happy to get. Uh, just always happy to figure out how, how we can make that process even better. Speaking of the legislature, uh, it is an issue I wanted to raise with you all to see if, uh, if you would support us weighing in on. We just learned last week that um, in the transportation budget, there's a proposal from VTrans to move the rail line. So if you go out Berry Street, uh, currently the rail line goes and crosses over a bridge past where Caledonia Spirits is and goes out toward Pioneer area and then down. 
Uh, they're proposing to basically discontinue that bridge, have it cross Berry Street, go across the front of Saban's Pasture and down along next to our bike path. Now, I will say that they forced us to move our bike path, which was going to be in that rail bed, so that there was a potential of an, a reactivation of active rail line. Um, so technically, uh, we, we can still fit our path in. There are some concerns, though. One is the... Um, the experience of being on the alternate transportation path with active rail next to you, and could there be uh, rail stacked up? Secondly, what, if any, impact might it have on uh, residential development in Sabin's Pasture with an active rail line in front? Third, we simply went through a very complicated and expensive um, fix for the rail crossing to access um, Caledonia uh, uh, Spirits, which may, in fact, be not used. Uh, and I think also the Team Bridges uh, uh, issued calls for um, the, the residential, the, the uh, excuse me, passenger rail running through there, and, and their concept really showed a lot of residential and commercial and parking areas near the Pioneer area. And then people would park and live there and then take these trains in and out. Um, if this were to happen, there would be no train going there. Uh, now whether the, and then that leaves the last question, which says what happens to the rail bridges? Do we continue to use those for passenger rail? Um, or do they just become abandoned and the city has, uh, you know, are they our problem or do we just have rotting V-Trans rail bridges? So I think there's a lot of questions that we have. We'd like to engage with this. I just, as I said, Senator Perchlick called this to my attention last week uh, and I didn't, I thought I would see whether the council had any feelings about this. Um, we may not be able to do anything. The rail has a lot of authority and V-Trans has a lot of authority, but I think it'd be good to at least try to get some of our questions answered. Questions, thoughts? We Head should down. ask lots of questions, and yeah. I think we should push to protect the uh, commitment we have to the bike path and to Saban's Pastures housing. Yeah. I would really like to see some maps um, yeah. of all of these things. It's, um, uh, oh no, we've talked about it, but I, uh, yeah. it would just be easier to think about it if there were some maps. Sure. Yeah. We can do that. Yep, great, okay. Um, still, still going. Um, we are in the process of our audit selection. Our, our we have annually put it out for RFP. We've got five proposals. I mention this only because this is an audit for all of you of our management team. And so asking if, if any of you would like to be involved in the selection process in years past. People have chosen not to, and we've made a recommendation, but we certainly don't want to assume that. Um, there is a range of prices and a range of qualifications this year. And we're going to go through an interview process, but wanted to open the door in case some of or any of you wanted to participate. No? Okay. 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 No. Cool. Okay. Yep, we trust you. Yep, you all right. Okay. Thanks, but yeah. we want to make sure you all. And you won't come back and tell you you didn't, didn't let us. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's right, exactly. And, um, and most fun of all is um, at the request of Councilmember Bate, we should talk about our summer schedule. So typically we've, uh, and we can always do it next meeting if it's not that easy now, but typically we've tried to drop one meeting in the summer if possible, and it's usually a July or August meeting. So our normally scheduled meetings in the summer would be July 10 and 24, and August 14 and 28. I have no preference. Well, I mean, even if people don't know now, if we're thinking about it, can right. we come back? We'll put it on the next, next agenda. So okay. just be thinking yeah. about whether. Okay. So yeah. the question usually comes down to do we want to <coughs> just drop one or then move one to like a middle week in between? Um, but it's usually one of the late July, early August meetings that we go without. Okay. And what that means for Warren's uh, perspective is sometimes we do end up having to call a quick meeting, like a five-minute meeting here to get some things, consent agenda and stuff passed, um, but it doesn't mean one of these full operations. Um, that's all I have. Steven. Uh, yes, Steve Whitaker. I'd like to uh, raise some of what I've been uh, briefly in the, in the State House with in regard to rail. The House put language requiring V-Trans to do a study of the passenger rail use of the bus cars, Ferry to Montpelier, and potentially Essex uh, to Burlington. Um, the Senate took it out, uh, and I spoke with Senator 
hardship as well. And part of this is the gamesmanship of what kids kids for tests are, are left for conference committee. But the fact that a demonstration project was not able to garner enough votes, we're being pushed around by an agency because we don't have a clear enough vision to articulate what we want. And there is support for what we want, but we have to be able to articulate it. And <coughs> that could involve council members specific, specifically talking to House or Senate Transportation Committee members and or the conferee, because it's pretty easy to get to the conferee. So just so you're aware, we as a council did actually support a letter that we sent to, um, did we send it to the House or the Senate? I think it was to the both. House. Yeah. Or was it to both? Because we sent, I think it was Senate. Yeah. Did we send it to the Senate? Okay. Well, there we go. So just so you're aware. Um, so we we have talked about it. We are interested um, and specifically cited um, the, the rail study. Well, if the study is, is was a step down from a demonstration project, I think the quicker we can get something showing that, that people are willing to ride this and here's where we need B-Trans. B-Trans money should be better split, spent uh, implementing the few absolutely necessary rail improvements uh, than studying something for a year and then another year past it. In another year, we may lose access to the bus cars because they'll be leased to another company out of state. Uh, those are sitting there at great expense in cost of interest. So I would encourage you to get active on this. Uh, your next meeting's not for a couple of weeks, and then it's going to be dire to have a clear articulation. It may be possible to insert something more than a V-Trans managed study, but a city involved demonstration project, right? Or viability, something more than just having V-Trans do a study that fills another year. Uh, there is support for that, both on at least one or two members of the Senate committee, but more in the House. So I just, I'm happy to talk offline about that, but uh, I feel like we're missing an opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything further? I'm all set. Okay. Uh, all but you right. don't need to go in, you know, just adjourn the meeting. Right? Yep. Great. Um, okay, so I, um, without objection, we're going to um, consider the meeting adjourned.